Roblox, a sandbox platform where you can create, play, and make any game you desire. This leaves open many styles of gameplay that range from 3D platformers, first-person shooters, choose-your-own-adventure, anything you could possibly imagine. This leaves open a door to a wide variety of gamers, and one of those groups of gamers wants to go fast. It was March, 2021. I was getting into Roblox speedrunning for the first time, and I had just made my first speedrun submissions ever. I had just made my speedrun.com account a month prior, and I already started running a couple of Roblox games. When I started getting into this hobby, I wondered, what is the oldest Roblox game on speedrun.com? Curious, I scrolled all the way up the page as the games became older and older, until I got to the top, and I saw... Roblox Adventure 2. It was the only game listed as 2007 as the release date for the game. As the oldest game on the site, I expected it to have a decent number of submissions, 20, 30, maybe even 50. But when I looked at the leaderboard, I was shocked. Only three runs had been submitted to just one of the categories, 100%. 100% glitchless or uh, um, glitchless was completely empty. The world record for the 100% category stood at 13 minutes and 55 seconds by Mega Kirby. I looked at the date of the run four years ago. I looked at the other two submissions, and they were also from four years ago. This game had been truly left in the shadows, and despite being one of the oldest Roblox games on the site, it was barely ever ran, or even played. The game just sat there, never to be ran, or played again. I looked at the forum page for the game, and I found a few somewhat recent posts which gave me a little bit of hope. However, one of the threads mentioned the accessibility of the game. Apparently, the game required you to go through a portal to access the game. However, there was one problem. The portal didn't work. This meant the game wasn't abandoned because people didn't want to play it. It was because people couldn't play it. No one was able to access the game because the teleporter itself didn't work. The game itself was located in an archive of old games the developer made years after they had finished them. I found the link to the game, and I clicked play. Surrounding me were a plethora of games with teleporters, such as Polyhex's Old House, the creator of the game, a Doomspire game, the Pluporium, but what stood out to me the most was Roblox Adventure Original and Roblox Adventure 2, both games side by side. I immediately became intrigued. I approached the Roblox Adventure 2 teleporter and waited. I heard a sound as if I was entering the nether from Minecraft. And then, I was in the game. Knowing that the teleporter still worked, I knew that this was the perfect opportunity for me to run a game and actually have a chance at getting world record. Finally, I could get my first record on a full game. I'd gotten a couple of records for individual levels, or ILs, 
but I had never gotten a record in a full game before, let alone a full Roblox game. Before long, I did an entire playthrough of the game, and for funsies, I decided to record my first playthrough of Roblox Adventure 2. Okay, here's the game. So we got pretty old games, so if I do say so myself. Roblox Adventure 2. So this is the one that we want to go for. Okay. Click on me to talk. Help! Someone has ripped Hobtown out of the ground. They hid the Roblox tokens too. You should go to Aztec Terraces first. So Roblox token. Okay. This is the okay. This is a blue coin. Find all three in a world, and you'll get a Roblox token. Okay. Let's look at these. Hi, I'm Mr. Loziet. It's Mr. Loziet, you dingus. When I go to a world, I usually lose stuff I found or brought. When you click me, I will tell you what it was and where you might have, or I might have lost it. Aztec Terraces. Alright, here we go. Let's go to Gusty Desert, eh? Okay, that's very, very fast. I do not like that. Let's go this way instead. Now, we can go Lemur Land. Okay, surely this couldn't be that bad. Oh, would you look at that? We found one right over here. Alright, we did it. Now we have nine tokens, so more than enough to get in here. All right, Jim, please, please. Nice. In order to get to the winner's room, we need 21 Roblox tokens. Let's get to work. One eternity later. We finally did it. Oh my god. Done. <sighs> After I played through the game, I looked on speedrun.com and I took a look at the world record video. The run starts on first movement. Mega Kirby's first task was to go to the chimney to collect the token inside of the house. Once Mega Kirby collects their first token, they head over to the first world of the game, Aztec Terraces. Once they enter Aztec Terraces, they go to their left, toward a waterfall. They jump behind the waterfall and enter a lava cave, where the second token is located. Then, when they head into Aztec Terraces for the second time, they go to their right, toward a small hut. In this hut, there is a skull item. After collecting the skull, Mega Kirby heads up the mountain nearby and gets one of the blue coins along the way. Then they enter a pipe and get their second token. Then, after they spawn back in the hub world again, they head back to Aztec Terraces to give the skull to the townsperson. After they do this, they go to the second hut right next to the townsperson. Inside this hut is a blue coin. Once Mega Kirby collects the second blue coin, they go up this pillar. Once they enter the White House, there is another token nearby. But before they collect the token, they get the last blue coin right next to the building. Mega Kirby then heads toward the next world of the game, Gusty Desert. Once they enter Gusty Desert, they immediately go to their right and climb up the edge of the mountain where another token is located. Along the way is the first blue coin of the world as well. When Mega Kirby enters Gusty Desert for the second time, they tread along the quicksand and go behind the pyramid where the second blue coin is located. After they collect the second blue coin, they work their way back around and enter the pyramid. After treading along some more quicksand, they collect a log which they give to yet another townsperson, and then they collect the next token. 
Mega Kirby then enters Dusty Desert for the third and last time. This time, they head forward toward the big statue. But before they actually enter the front of the statue, they go around the back and enter a secret door where the last blue coin is located. Then, they go back into the front entrance of the statue and navigate their way through a long set of platforms until they get to the top of the statue where the last token of the world is located. Once Mega Kirby enters the third world, named Lemurland, they immediately head toward the cave that is below the spawn area. In this cave, there is a blue coin and a rock to give to the townsperson. Afterwards, Mega Kirby stumbles upon Noobly. Noobly is the boss fight and the only boss fight in the game. To defeat Noobly, you need to drag him along the thwomps for long enough until he eventually dies. Mega Kirby gets a very good Noobly boss fight and gets the token rather quickly. Once Mega Kirby enters the world again, they give the rock to the townsperson near the spawn area, and then they head to their right toward another cave. In this cave, there are spikes, which if you are not careful, can kill you. Mega Kirby also stumbles upon the second blue coin, which they collect. Once Mega Kirby takes a left and gets the next token, they enter Lemurland once again, and start going down the same path, but this time when they're in the cave, they take a right, and they have to avoid some more spikes. This time, they're going farther up the mountain, and once they activate the yellow switch up top, they collect the token at the top of the hill. Oh, and of course, they get the last blue coin in the world, which is also next to where the token is located. When Mega Kirby enters the last world, named Bank Complex, they head over toward the big globe in the middle of the room. Once they get near the globe, they activate a blue switch, which spawns some platforms that lead both up top of the globe, where there is a blue coin, and toward another part of the level, inside of the wall. As Mega Kirby continues down the hallway, they jump behind a portrait. Behind this portrait is a blue coin that was hidden away. They continue down the hallway, and they jump behind yet another similar looking portrait, where they drop into a room where they collect the ID card, which they must give to the townsperson near the globe. After jumping along some escalators, Mega Kirby ends up getting their first token in the world. Then they enter Bank Complex a second time to give the ID card to the townsperson. After Mega Kirby gives the ID card, they head back down into the same hallway, but this time take a right. They then head on top of the counter, and then enter yet what seems like another hallway, but this time they have to avoid objects as they are being dragged down this long blue hallway. Once they finally get to the end, there is another token that is waiting for them in a glass cage. Finally, Mega Kirby enters Bank Complex for the last time, and enter what seems like a vent, which enters into a sewer system where the last blue coin and token is located. Once Mega Kirby collects both of these items, they head over to the winner's room, where time stops. 13.55 I saw the potential for this game to go much further. However, there was one glaring issue. The quicksand and gusty desert acted differently in the record than what I experienced in the game. The quicksand took away your health slowly in the record run, even giving you speed as you walked on it and allowed you to skip nearly a minute off of the stage. But when I played it, it killed you almost instantly. This was a big problem, because the run used the quicksand as a shortcut to get to places much faster, not to mention, the platform that span around super fast in my playthrough moved much slower in the record. I realized that this is going to be a lot harder than I thought. After I learned this, I felt lost. I had no idea where to go. A week passed. Two weeks passed. Eventually. Nearly a month passed since I last touched the game. I just couldn't get the motivation I needed to get a run in. Then, in the beginning of May, 
I finally decided it was time. I scrolled up and found the game. I was determined to finish the best run that I could. I had found a pattern that was somewhat consistent with the fast-moving platform on Gusty Desert, and I was able to get out of there with as low as three deaths, which for me, at the time, was pretty good. I was getting there, but I needed to do better. Eventually, after many attempts, I managed to get my time down to a 1425. Even though I was still 30 seconds off of the record, I still felt very happy with this time. Regardless, I continued to grind the game for a few days. I found a precise trick in Gusty Desert that allowed me to collect the token at the top of the statue, and then fall all the way back down to get the coin at the back of the statue before I was teleported to the hub. This saved me from having to go around the statue and collect the coin separately. This was the first major time save that I could find that wasn't used in the record, and it saved about 10 seconds. However, it still wouldn't be enough to make up for the lost time the quicksand took away from me. One day, I booted up the game to continue my grind, but when I joined the game, I realized this time, I wasn't alone. I looked at the tab, and I saw that someone else had already joined the server before I did. After communicating with them in chat, I realized that they weren't just another person that happened to randomly stumble upon the game. They were another speedrunner. Their name was Serpent. I couldn't believe it. At this point, I had rarely seen anyone in this game at all, let alone another speedrunner. After four years of nothing from this game, the two people trying to run this game happened to come together at the same time. From the looks of it, Serpent had been running this game for a little while now, just like myself, and his goal was getting the first ever sub-13 time. I thought that this would be impossible considering the update that Gussy Desert had received, until that same day, I noticed something that would shock me even more. The quicksand in Gusty Desert didn't kill me nearly as fast. Even when I stepped on it for long periods of time, it seemed to have the same properties as the world record did. It was almost like the game had suddenly been updated and changed the physics of the game again. But even so, I knew that now, I had a real shot at getting the record. With this realized, I had a newfound determination, and I knew that I could take the record. The question was who was going to get it first, me or Serpent? This would mark one of the first rivalries in this game's history. The battle was on for Sub-13. Serpent claimed to have gotten a 1351, beating the previous 4 year old record by just 4 seconds. However, he was far from done. A couple of days later, he destroyed his time with a 1313, leaving all of the other times in the dust. However, even with this, he had a slow noobly fight, which overall cost him about half a minute. He knew he could still do better. And on the 7th of May, Serpent did this.
Despite my best efforts, Serpent had done it. The first minute barrier had been broken after nearly half a decade. This was a big moment for this game's history, and it was only the beginning of what was to come. Even though I was still in awe of Serpent's world record, I knew I could still do better. I needed to get myself in gear if I wanted to have a chance at getting the world record. I continued my grind, coming so close and yet so far. But then, just two days after Serpent made history, I finally got a good run out of Lemurland. From then, I went on autopilot, and this is what happened. I had finally done it. I finally got a record in a full game speedrun for the first time. As soon as I got this time, I went to the leaderboards and submitted it as quickly as I could. And I waited, and waited. About a week after I achieved my time, I went on to speedrun.com and I saw that I had a few notifications that I hadn't checked yet. I clicked on the top right and I saw the message that I was hoping to see for a while. Your Roblox Adventure 2 1248 100% time has been verified. I was thrilled. I quickly clicked on the notification expecting to see myself at the top of the leaderboard. I eagerly clicked on the notification and I looked at the first place time. What I saw shocked me. A 1237 had been achieved. This time, however, someone new had stepped up to the plate. This new player would become one of the major competitors and speedrunner for the game. The player's name was Mango E. I watched the whole run. He did the levels in a different order doing Lemurland before Gusty Desert, most likely due to personal preference. However, this meant nothing compared to what he did in Bank Complex. This run would change the way that the game was played forever. It turns out, he was able to find a way to clip through the glass in the Bank Complex by typing the command slash e laugh in chat and then pressing shift lock against the wall to clip through and collect the token. This was the very first clip that was ever performed in this game's history. Glitches like this have been used in many other Roblox games up to this point, but this was the first time that I had ever seen it myself. Soon after this run was performed, it was quickly found out that you could clip through the building where you collect the chimney token, which saved a big chunk of time at the very beginning of a run, almost 15 seconds. Clipping through the wall would become a staple of this game, as it had in many other Roblox titles. One night, I was exploring the game to see if I could find any trick of my own. I went to Aztec, Gusty, I found nothing. I started to fool around in Lemurland, seeing if by some chance I could clip through something, but even if I did, I didn't think it would be any use on a level like this. I kept randomly clipping against walls, waiting for something to happen. Then, unexpectedly, something happened. Yeah, this clip was the most complicated clip in the run by far. When you do the clip, you have a chance of getting stuck in the floor if your alignment is just a little bit off, forcing you to reset. If you did the clip correctly, 
you should find yourself in a wall. When you're in that wall, you must move right along the wall. You might get stuck against another wall, and when this happens, you need to turn right slowly with shift lock activated. And then once you're past that, then you're home free. And then voila, you've made it to the other side. I implemented this new clip into my next run, which clocked in at a 1225, even with a death in Lemurland. I finally got myself a true world record. Is what I would have said if a user named Beans and Paste didn't get the world record the day prior with a 1219. What made it worse is that he didn't even use the Lemurland clip. <sighs> In all seriousness, this run was really good. There were no deaths, and he had a very fast noobly boss fight. He used a different method to clip through the box and bank, this time using shift lock against the corner, similar to how we were able to clip into the token at the very beginning in the chimney. At this point, getting sub-12 was inevitable, and at this time, two people were on the verge of being able to do it, Mango E and Beans and Pace, who would soon become some of my greatest friendly rivals throughout this journey. We would all join the same server and practice doing runs together on a daily basis. The quest to sub-12 was on. Session of attempts, I saw celebration in chat. Mango E was speaking in all caps, saying that they had achieved the very first sub 12 minute time. Achieved by him on the 19th of May, he had just completed a run in 11 minutes and 50 seconds. He found a safer strategy to get the bank clip, and he nailed the Lemurland clip and also nailed the blue coin trick in Gusty Desert. Though he did play it safe in the last portion of the run, this was yet another minute barrier cut off from the 4 year old world record. This was a monumental achievement by Mango E, as he had pushed the game farther than any of us thought was possible. The grind continued. I continued to try improving my time that very same day, and I was getting some fast paced runs out of Gusty Desert but I just couldn't close them out in the latter levels, especially in Lemurland. A common choking point was the jump on getting the last blue coin in Lemurland. This is a very tight jump, and you need to do the jump both to get the blue coin and back to the main course of the stage. No that Lemurland jump would become one of the staple parts of the run, and certainly one of the hardest and most chokeworthy parts of the run. I'd gotten a run past Gusty Desert. I got a pretty fast chimney clip and aced Aztec. After getting an okay noobly fight in Lemurland, I was still ahead of my PB. On the lemur clip, I got it 5th try, which lost me a good 7 seconds. After nearing the big jump, I was mentally preparing myself to get past it. But before I could, I died on the platforms right before the jump. Even though I had just lost 10 seconds after dying, Something kept me going. I still felt like there was a glimmer of hope, a small chance that everything else could go right and I could still get a PB. I decided to continue the run, and I approached the blue coin jump, and I made it to the blue coin and back flawlessly. I quickly grabbed the token at the top after some sloppy platforming, and when I split, I realized I was a staggering half a minute ahead of my PB even with a death, again. Astonished, I kept the run going, determined to get my first sub-12 minute time.
I aced Bank Clip and did all of Bank Complex as fast as I could. When I collected the last token in Bank Complex, I raced toward the final hub area. My final time was 11.36. Not only did I completely destroy my sub-12 goal, I have finally gotten my first legitimate world record in the game. No one else had been able to get a faster time than me, and there was no run that had not yet been submitted that was faster than mine. I finally got a legitimate world record, and no one could contest with me on it. Well, at least for a day. Mango Eeg had quickly reclaimed the world record title on the very same day, with an 11.32. After seeing just how much room there was for improvement, I came back with a newfound motivation. But then, as I was playing the next day, something was... different. What the heck? They changed the locations. What? I started playing the game as it was being updated. Oh. I didn't know what was going on, and I asked any of the other runners if they knew what was going on. I was soon told that the game was being updated by the one and only Polyhex, the person who created the game. We were able to get in contact with Polyhex so that we would all be up to date on the upcoming changes that the game would soon receive. However, a lot of these updates would change how the game would be speedran and played forever. And that wasn't just by the change of where the coin was in Aztec. Some of the new features added were simply visual ones. Now, whenever you collected a token or a blue coin, there would be a visual cue that would tell you that you collected the item, and a text box would pop up on screen telling you that you collected a token, rather than you having to look up at the top right corner to see if your token counter changed. They also made a sound effect for both tokens and blue coins. This was a much needed change, because now we would be able to actually tell if we collected something or if we missed something, especially the blue coins. However, there was also some huge changes that would change the way the game worked and played for the rest of speedrunning history. Certain areas of the game were either made easier or harder now. One of the very apparent changes was the Noobly boss fight, the two thwomps that stayed stationary throughout the fight now moved up and down, and there were little walls on one corner of each thwomp. This might not seem to have made much of a difference at first, but this actually made the boss fight a lot easier. Instead of having to constantly lure Noobly to the thwomp, you could now trap Noobly against the wall and let the thwomp smash him. This made for much better consistency getting past the Noobly fight on a decent pace. Another big change was the addition of Thwomps in the Gusty Desert statue. This made the statue much harder to clear now because you had to watch out for the Thwomps. I asked Polyhex to add platforms around them because, well, I'm a wuss. There was also the addition of another change in Gusty Desert and that was made in the Pyramid. The two yellow walls that peacefully sat at the side in the previous version now moved from side to side, easily knocking you off if you were not careful. But by far the biggest change out of everything that occurred was the addition of the 22nd token. Originally, this second token was made out just to be up for display, just like the blue coin in the hub world. However, 
with clips being implemented into the run, Polyhex decided to make this its own token. The only way to collect the token is to literally clip into the box. There is no puzzle, no secret entrance, the only way to get it is to clip into the box. This made for a huge time save, because now we can collect another token at the hub and replace it for one of the other tokens in the later levels. After checking all of the tokens, the general consensus was to skip the statue token in Gusty, and instead just go around the building and collect the blue coin. The route had been changed a lot throughout this update, and naturally, that stirred up a little bit of controversy in the small community. After a long debate, it was agreed that we separate the updated and non-updated versions of the game. Now, there would be a fresh leaderboard with no official times on it, free for anyone to set the bar for the next stage in this game's speedrun history. And I took up the opportunity upon myself with yet another big milestone. Although I did manage to achieve two new PBs in the next week or so, neither of them had surviving video. One of these times happened to be the first ever sub 1130. As you can imagine, I was heartbroken, but I was determined not to give up. Even with these two unrecorded PBs, I knew that the next minute barrier was right under my feet. And just a few days later, I was able to get this run with surviving video. Granted, it was faster partially because of the newly added token in the hub, but who cares? It was the last minute barrier broken that would stand in the double digit range. I'd finally made a big impact in the community. Except, there was one problem. The game was being updated from May 20th until the night of May 21st. In between the old version and the completed version was the period where small changes would be added here and there as we were playing the game. Almost every time we joined a new server, something would have changed during that period of time. Half the time, Polyhex would be in the server as well. By the time I had completed my 1058, it was nighttime on May 21st. I thought I was all good. I thought that the updates had finally finished. However, there was a small but crucial detail that was changed in between the old version and the final version. The last Lemurland blue coin that you collected was deemed to be one of the most choke-worthy parts of the run. In my run, the coin had been moved to a slightly different spot next to its original state. This small change made it much easier to get the coin just by simply activating the yellow platforms and jumping on the platform toward the coin. Why was this so big, you ask? In the official final version of the game, this coin was moved back into the same spot as it was in the old version. After everyone, including myself, took notice of this, it stirred up some controversy in the community. Eventually, after a long debate in the newly added Discord server, my run was eventually rejected. The first sub-11 was no more. After less than a week of my heart sinking because of my run rejection, I was able to use that sadness to make me feel nothing when I was on a good pace on a run. Whether that was a good or bad thing, I'll never know.
Not only did I cross the 11 minute barrier on the completed version of the game, but it was absolutely crushed. With Mango Ian Beanson paced focusing on IL runs, I was sitting pretty as the first submitted run to the new version of the game on speedrun.com. Speaking of IL runs, one IL focused on a lot was the first two hub tokens in Roblox Adventure 2. Even though it was just two tokens, this IL was by far the hardest due to the two clips you need to do in quick succession to even have a chance at getting the fast time. While Beats and Paste Mango E and I were trying to see who could get the fastest time, we were all duking it out to see who would be able to get the first sub 23 and 22. And the time managed to get all the way down to 21 seconds when Mango E ended up beating us to the punch. Currently, none of us have been able to get any ILs or runs faster than 21 seconds. However, it is theoretically possible if you do both clips in just 0.2 seconds or, or something. Well, there you go, you happy mango? Anyways, back to your scheduled programming. Two weeks passed. I'm still sitting on top as the only run submitted to the new 21 tokens category. I had been taking a break from the category for a while to focus on IL runs, and on a couple of other games I had been practicing at the time. But soon, someone would break the silence. On June 7th, I woke up to see that my record had been stolen from me. And by who else but Beans and Paste. By just two seconds, with a 10.41, he had clutched his own world record in the category. Beans had also stolen my glitchless world record on the same day. Even though he had only improved my time by two seconds, it would take me a while to get a good run again. A couple of days later, a Roblox speedrunner named Loafs joined the community. Loafs had already obtained a fair share of records in his time. We were both practicing the game while in a voice channel. Loafs decided to practice each world individually, starting with Aztec, Gusty, and eventually Lemurland. However, something odd happened. In the past, we tried collecting a token and then quickly resetting our character, but each time we did this, we always spawned back in the same place, the hub. Nothing seemed to work. Nonetheless, Loafs decided to give it a try on one of the tokens in Lemurland, the token on top of the mountain. He climbed his way up, past the spikes, across the yellow platforms, and he grabbed the token and he waited two seconds, and then reset. But of course, we all knew it wasn't going to work. We tried every single token in the game, and all of them just send you back to the hub world like usual. Except this time, he spawned right under the token. When I saw him perform this first hand, I was baffled. How is it that this token was the only one that let you spawn back? Not to mention, right under the token. We both assumed that this token had some weird coding bug that allowed you to respawn in the level. Whatever the case, this was a huge discovery. We were quickly able to implement this new trick into runs by using yet another clip to get into the token into the cave much faster. What made this discovery even bigger was that we could finally obsolete the jump toward the blue coin, which killed so many runs in the past. We could now collect it after respawning from the token, and then do the clip in the wall, which happens to drop right onto the token in the cave. This saved over half a minute, and when comparing that to the overall runtime of the game already, that was astronomical. However, we were unsure why this token was the only one that seemed to work this way. The next day, we tried some testing on the tokens, trying to see if we could crack the code. Then, Loafs had an idea. He got out his big brain and ran an exploit on the game. He was modding the game so that he could see where all of the checkpoints in the maps were located. And what he found would change the course of the speedrunning scene of this game forever. 
All of the checkpoints with the exploit turned on were highlighted in a transparent whitish color. All of these places is where a player would spawn if they had died after touching a certain checkpoint. One of these checkpoints happened to be placed right under the token at the top of the hill in Lemurland. Then, after seeing it explained to us something that should have been super obvious to us but totally flew over our heads, everything clicked. You see, every token worked exactly the same way. Whenever you collected a token, whatever your precious checkpoint was before you collected it would be erased. This presumably was to keep someone from resetting their character after collecting the token and abusing the checkpoint system. But there was one way to get around this. If you collect a token and then hit a checkpoint before you spawn back into the hub and reset at any time, you will spawn back at that checkpoint. That was why we were spawning right back under the token in Lemurland. It was because there just so happened to be a checkpoint right underneath the token. As soon as we finally understood this, we quickly used this monumental breakthrough to completely change of how the rest of the game was going to be played. Very quickly, we were able to implement a 10 second time save in Aztec. After collecting the token inside of the White House, we could quickly run toward the entrance and hit the checkpoint just outside of the house right before being teleported back to the hub. This saved us from having to walk all the way back to the level from the hub, and it allowed us to collect the blue coin and the token in the cave after we spawned back. We were also able to find another big time save in Gusty Desert. Right before the token, after climbing alongside the cliff, is a checkpoint right at the corner before the ladder. Going back down after getting the token allows us to get to the checkpoint and reset. This saves almost another 20 seconds from the run. With both of these additional checkpoint abuse strats, we knew it was possible to get a sub 10 and beyond. Before I could get a punch in, Los had a new world record of 1031 using the new reset strategies. Though this was a good 10 second cut from Beans' world record, this was only just scratching the surface of what was possible. It was time to end this once and for all. Sub 10 was just on the horizon. Is that gonna happen or run?
It's been a good few months since the last minute barrier was broken. The world record now stands at a 941 held by Yu Waku. In their record, they implemented another strategy called item boosting or speed glitch, which allows you to move faster as long as you hold WE or WND while jumping with an item in hand. If done correctly, this can save up to 10 seconds in the run, maybe even more. As I continue throughout this journey, I started realizing that I had started focusing less on my own personal accomplishments and started focusing on the community as a whole, the friends that I had made along the way. To me, that was more important than any of my individual accomplishments. When the sub 10 minute barrier was broken, we all broke it together. It was all because of the culmination of everyone's efforts in the community that we were able to achieve such a legendary milestone for a game that was seemingly left to be forgotten. While it has been a long time and all of us have been moving to different games, I will never forget the memories that I shared with this small community that we made to revive and restore the history of Roblox Adventure 2 speedrunning. Thank you all so much for watching. Have a wonderful day.